have lots of people who weren't able to attend that will be watching this later. So thanks for joining us today. Um, we're going over UDL Applied with multiple means of representation. We're super excited about our pres presenter today, Lori Cooney. So thanks everyone for joining. Just a little background for those of you that are new to our ECHO, UDL is an educational framework designed to enhance teaching and learning for all. It allows us to tailor goals, assessments and materials to individual needs, ensuring that everyone has an equal opportunity to succeed. In this ECHO series, we'll explore practical strategies for applying UDL. In our typical ECHO format, we would have a formal didactic portion and follow that with a case presentation. But today we've got an interactive presentation with Lori. So we're gonna, we're gonna do it a little different. And we're really excited about that. Participation, your participation is vital. It's what makes Echoes stand out and be different. So we aim to create an interactive community where everyone communicates and is here to support each other. We encourage everyone to turn their camera on throughout the session sessions as long as you're comfortable with that. And if you're not, that's fine too. We appreciate participants, participants being engaged and asking questions and we love getting feedback. This is a great way to solidify skills that we learn in the presentations and get direct advice. So in the future, if you would ever like to present a case study, just let us know and we can send you more information on that. Confidentiality, individual privacy is of the utmost importance to us. When sharing information during any parts of our discussions or presentations, please avoid using real names or any initials or identifying information. And introductions. I'm Jessica Ryswig. I'm a research associate at North Dakota Centers for People with Disabilities. I'm on the ASTEP project, the IMPACT Consortium, and a project coordinator for the ECHO series. Super excited to be here. Super excited about this presentation today. Krista, if you would like to introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. I'm Krista Opstall, and I'm the project director for Project ECHO here at NDCPD. And thank you guys for making or being able to join our session today with this being a makeup session. And I will go ahead and introduce Lori. Um, Lori Cooney is a program director of inclusive education and curriculum design at the Institute for Community Inclusion at UMass Boston. She has over 25 years of extensive experience in designing and delivering professional development on UDL inclusive education, learning plans, curriculum development, course design, technology integration, college and career readiness, and assessment strategies. She is a technical training advisor for the education and transition team and has facilitated the techno technology and UDL group for Think College's National Coordinating Center for Transition to post-secondary education programs, TIPSID, since 2011. Lori's many notable achievements include receiving the 2012 Mass CEU, CUE Pathfinder Award. I'm sorry, there's a lot of words here. <laughs> a Technology Humanist Award from Worcester Polytechnic Institute and is, rec is recognized as a Krista McAuliffe teacher by the Challenger Learning Center at Framingham State University. I apologize if I butchered any of those words or names. I will go, go ahead, ahead and share and let Lori we say what we say Worcester out here, not Worcester. <laughs> it's, oh. it's a quite and, the and accent your, we have. <laughs> your accent came out there. <laughs> yep. awesome. Worcester. All right. Anyway. <laughs> um, you ready for me uh, to start? Yes, sorry. Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for uh, being patient about, um, you know, changing this session to this week. I was sick last week. Um, I was going to try to power through, but knowing we were recording, it's probably better I didn't. So what I'm going to do is, um, you know, we'll just get right at it. I have a lot of content. I'm going to skip over a few things. I just want it to be there so you had it. But if you can go to Nearpod, I'm going to share my screen. I put a link in the chat. This is going to be an interactive presentation, so let me see how I share this. Okay. Assuming everyone can share my see my screen right now. 
Great. And I have two screens. If I'm looking to the left, it's just your the chats on the other screen. So so thank you for that. Um, so today what we'll do is if you can open up a tab, if you're on a uh, computer or if you have a mobile device on you, you can go to nearpod.com and you can enter in this code where it says students join a lesson. And what you want to do is um, enter in 5UJ9K or just click that link and it will bring you right there. Uh, it's up to you if you want to use your real name or you can use Disney characters or uh, book characters. I don't really care or just <laughs> anything you want to do today to join in. But I promise it'll be uh, pretty engaging. So. Once we're in, I will kind of go over my agenda with you. So I have eight people in so far, but for for a minute, I'll kind of just explain what what the uh, what the day will look like. This presentation will look like. Uh, first, we'll do a little icebreaker. It's just something fun using Mentimeter. Um, some of you probably have used it. Just something to like get to know each other a little bit. Um, I'll talk a little bit about inclusion and accessibility, some tips and strategies. We'll do some engagement practices, um, and also inclusive practices in higher ed, inclusive higher ed, and AI for artificial intelligence. So just a like show of hands or like Zoom hands, how many people are using AI or chat GBT or any of the, the new tools that, that are out there right now? You can even write a comment in, in there if you want to just... Do we the one? Some people are great. Awesome. Um, so we had a few new people join us while we're doing this. So if you could just, I'm gonna just pop the link back into the presentation. And then what we'll do right now is everyone, um, you should see a link to this slide right here. If you just click on it, it will open up menti.com. If you're not logged in, here's here's the link in the chat. And it's just a little question about um, what you know what you like to do. And I have the like, what do you like to do in your free time? So you can go to menti dot com and click on that link and just like start adding things you can add up to three different things at a time and you can continue to add and what this is so neat i just did the um i did the one that you just do word clouds but there's a lot of other features on mentimeter if you're using it or not using it and what it will do is a lot of people like to read so it'll probably have read like really large um, because so many people have said that or um, yeah, puzzles, boating is me. I live right by the water. That's just a picture I took of my, of where my boat is. Um, I live on the Cape, so I'm kind of far away. I'll try to cover my Boston accent as best I can. <laughs> um, yeah, you guys are doing a really good job. podcasts, photography, eat, connect with friends. This is all healthy, healthy things. Not that anyone would probably put anything unhealthy on here, <laughs> but, but it's still good to, to do. I like to, I like to go uh, to different um, breweries when I'm in Vermont. Sometimes, you know, you just stop and check those out. Uh, yeah. Different things. So, so just a little activity to, to get us to get to know each other. Um, do you have like a lake or something that you paddleboard at people, whoever's a paddleboarder. That was me and I'm in Washington. Oh, great. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. No, you're good. I was Lots just of water. Lots of water over there. Yeah, that's good. Thank you for indulging me with that fun little exercise. Um, we talked about this, my, my shark risk. Yeah. Right. This, <laughs> this is true. We're all a little afraid of sharks. Um, but I want to show you this video. I, I don't know if you know what this does. And I don't know what everybody does on the call, but I'm going to just show you this video of what Mentimeter is doing with AI. And I'm going to explain AI a little bit later. 
but this is really like it blows my mind and i hope it i hope it does yours as well so it takes um With mentimeter it's super easy to get yes, plenty of responses from your audience using our interactive questions. But what about analyzing your results? Well, with our new AI grouping feature, we have made this a breeze. Let's have a look at a real world example. Here I have a presentation from a few weeks ago where our head of HR went up on stage and asked the entire company, what does HR mean to you? As we can see, she received 76 responses. And while there are a lot of good answers in here, it's hard for her to get an overview. But as we can see, there's a little button here that says press space to show groups. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And we can see that it's sorting the groups. And here we can see the sorted and labeled groups. This has all been done automatically. And all of the responses have been put into one of these groups. If you want, you can click on the groups and see all of the individual responses within that group. And while this gives a lot of insight to the presenter themselves, it's also great for the audience to be able to see how the rest of the audience thinks and what trends there are in that specific group. This feature is now out to anybody who has AI tools enabled in their Mentimeter account. I put a help article here below where you can read on how you can activate this in your own account. Happy grouping. So what's really neat about it is it does take open-ended questions and it takes them and puts them into categories, which is kind of what, what we just did a little bit with the word cloud. But in a classroom setting or working with students, if you were to do any sort of um, you know, chapter readings and you wanted the students to kind of pick out the main parts of a reading, or a, a topic that you've taught them, you can easily have them represent it using this open-ended response system. And then uh, you'd be able to kind of group those up with, with different uh, responses. So I think that's a real powerful thing. I think it's a good way to use AI. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that later, but um, I asked if anyone needed an accommodation. So please let me know if you have hearing impairment, any cognitive, I'll try to read everything. Uh, on the slides for you. And I also put in, um, you know, Nearpod has immersive readers. So if you need to, you could press the, the text on the screen. Uh, disability, it impacts all of us. There, you know, one in four adults in the United States has some form of disability. And I don't think everybody discloses that, especially in the higher ed setting. Uh, when Once you move from high school to college, the um, the requirements are a little bit different. IEP isn't around anymore for the students. It's a ADA, it falls under the American with Disabilities Act. And so sometimes as instructors or project directors or um, people in the college setting, we, we can't always predict who's in our class. But what I can do is kind of show you a little bit about um, what that looks like and why we need to think about inclusive design and representation um, for cognition. And this is just a really great video put out by Microsoft that kind of gives you a good feel of what that's like for people. So let me just play that. Every human on the planet approaches situations differently. We all have different ways to think about problems, different things we need to make decisions and different ways we like to learn. Yet the products and services we use every day don't typically account for those differences. They force us to adapt to one way of thinking. And that causes all kinds of problems, from mild irritation to learning curves that are steeper than they need to be, all the way to outright exclusion of folks who think differently. There's a better way. At Microsoft, we've built a practice of inclusive design. The methods we use talk about exclusion from the start and the awareness that exclusion happens unless we deliberately work against it. Now we're introducing inclusive design for cognition so we can thoughtfully adapt our products to the way people think instead of asking people to adapt to products. The work starts with understanding the motivation behind any endeavor. We identify the goals and tasks for that motivation and what cognitive demands might be in the way. As we do this with all inclusive design efforts, we learn from a diverse range of human beings, the true experts in adapting. We absorb the different ways people approach problem solving. Some people learn by trial and error, poking around to make something work. Some people learn by reading or watching videos to take a step-by-step -step approach. 
Some people require absolute silence to focus, while others thrive on noise and energy. When we deliberately seek out understanding and work with people with different mindsets, we can create more flexible, adaptable products. So let's focus on what's universally important to all people, understanding their motivations, what they're trying to accomplish, and the way they want to achieve. Let's create adaptive ways for everyone to participate. Only then will we be able to create something everyone can use to reach their goals. To learn more about inclusive design, go to inclusive.microsoft.design. And Microsoft's coming out with a lot of new tools, and uh, I'm not going to go over those today. That's a whole other, like, probably two-hour session, but um, I want to just talk a little bit about these um, disclosed and undisclosed di disabilities. And on the right side, you'll see things like ADHD, anxiety, depression, speech impediments, um, hearing, autism, vision, cognitive, um, intellectual, and developmental disability. Those are pretty much, you know, what people usually figure that others might have as a, a diagnosed or undiagnosed disability. But some of them that are difficult to kind of understand is dyslexia. Um, a lot of people think dyslexia is just reversing letters in a sentence or in a word, but it's a lot more than that. It's reading comprehension, it's spelling, it's writing. There's dyscalculia, um, which is um, your numbers. And I this is something I have, which I reverse numbers sometimes. I don't know why, it just, it just is what it is. Um, dyspraxia, which is motor skill issue, um, fine motor skills and, you know, working on with your hands and, and things like that. And then dysgraphia, which is um, the uh, disability is to like putting thoughts on paper and things look backwards and reversed and um, you know, it's a slow processing speed. So these are just some disabilities that you might want to be aware of that you may not have encountered before and may, or maybe you have and feel free to like type in the chat or let me know. Um, I did this little activity to get um, people to kind of feel what it's like to have visual perception and see where everyone is at. So I'm going to play this little um, like game with you not game but like what do you see there type it in the chat or like raise your hand what's the first thing that you see in this picture yep the man yeah does it some people see the old man <laughs> or does anyone have trouble seeing the old man or the two ladies in the picture? Is it tough to see? You have to back up a little bit, go a little closer. Um, you know, there's an umbrella here. There's one lady with the with the dress and then another one facing. Um, but then also, if you look, you'll see two eyes, a nose and a mouth for, for this. So it's fairly, fairly easy um, to, to see the two if somebody points out what it is, right? Well, here is something that is called the magic eye. And I love using this because, well, not everybody can see it. So how many people, you can raise your hand or you can just like put a thumbs up. Have you seen the magic eye and have you, and are you able to, anyone see that before? Yeah. So this is a moving magic eye. So you have to really look closely and I'm going to give you all a minute and let me know if you can see it. I'm going to give you a hint in a second. Just raise your hand if you can see it. Don't type in the answer yet. Anybody? No, it's hard, right? I have an incredible ability to see these things. I don't know what it is. <laughs> um, so, okay, so let me, um, so this is a visual processing issue. Let's do audio. Let me help you with a recording of the description of what it is. And let's see if you, if you can hear me. Is there any horse? Is there any horse? Can anyone decipher that? 
Is there any horse? No. Okay. How about now? And if I play that? It's a running horse. It's a running horse. You may or may not like my voice, sorry. But <laughs> so my point is, if you're visually, if you have a visual, like cognitive issue, sometimes it's really hard to see things. But then if you have an audio processing disorder, it's also hard to hear things or to make sense of them. But if I slow things down, if I slow the sound down, uh, you all were able to hear it. If I put text with it and have the sound slow, you you still are able to decipher what I'm saying. Um, and, and that's the thing. You might have students in your class that you're moving at a pace that are really, really fast. And if you're moving um, so fast that some of your students are getting left behind, you have to know that um, providing those multiple means of accommodations, the most representation, those kinds of things will help all students, all individuals, whether it's a program, if it's your class, if it's in the library, if you can think about ways to kind of use text, use the vision, use the sound and slow it all down, everyone can still succeed. So just because you're slower at processing or you're slower at seeing something doesn't mean that you're not going to be able to succeed. And that's just my point of this little activity. So hopefully you, you like that. We have to consider all needs from the beginning. And that's, that's the key to it. But the question always is like, how do I do that? And that's where I'm going to come in and kind of like explain to you, you know, designing for accessibility. And this doesn't mean that you're designing only for people who have um, disability. It's just thinking of them at the beginning, seeing, hearing, touching, thinking, unlocking those tools. And this, um, web content accessibility guides, this this principles of accessibility called poor. It's uh, called perceivable, understandable, operable, and robust. So perceivable that they're able to, um, via sight, hear, or touch, they're able to perceive, they're able to understand using clear labels and instructions. It's operable where um, you can use navigation and keyboards. So uh, without getting into too much detail, when you create a table, making sure that the table reads from left to right so that screen readers read from left to right. Uh, and then also robust using assistive technology browsers and devices. So I'm very mindful when I use tools that they are ex completely accessible. I have immersive you know, readers, um, ways that you can use speech to text and text to speech and, and all those kinds of things and turning on closed caption. Um, having audio transcripts for the deaf or hard of hearing users, uh, describing images on your pages. So if you have, um, how many per, how many people teach here? Do I have a lot of teachers or people that support teachers? So if you have a syllabus and you have an image, you want to make sure that you use the alt text so that if a student is using a reader, that they can have um, a description of that image for them. Same thing when you're doing anything online. Um, operable are like for people that have motor disabilities, uh, arthritis even. I mean, really bad arthritis is hard to like grip things and, and um, touch. So just being able to kind of have multiple ways to interact with things. Um, that means putting your content online and also printing them maybe or having um, access to them in other ways. Understanding things, targeting your language for your audience, for their reading level. Um, having those transcripts, font consistency, navigation, um, even when you're creating a course using Blackboard or anything like Canva, Canvas, um, same thing. You want to make sure that you have these um, all like easily navigable. I like to say that word, but I never get it right. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and then videos should be closed captioned for the deaf or hard of hearing that you have, again, those audio um, transcripts and alt text. So. I like to um, use this this website uh, to do create like to create accessible documents. Um, when you're creating a document, when you're creating a syllabus, I see I have seen so many documents and lesson plans and syllabus by and just content, just all text, and that just can be really hard for some people to navigate through. So this is a way for you to use headings, create lists. Um, 
meaningful hyperlinks, you can actually hyperlink within a document page. So if you have a very long reading or an assignment or an article and you want to link down to the bottom of the page, that's a meaningful hyperlink um, using the tables wisely, like I said, and then um, exporting them to different formats. So the University of Washington, I know, Jessica, you said you're in Washington, so uh, they have a really wonderful accessibility link to create these documents and they have all sorts of um, like help centers. So I just gave you a link to this. You're gonna all have access to this presentation after this. So you can use that. Um, yeah, every office, like technology office, Krista will have resources to help you with alt text and things like that for sure. Um, then, um, but you can use this. So use an accessibility checker. Uh, Ali uh, for Blackboard is really great. It will check the accessibility for you. I gave you a link to the, the like the help center, but also Microsoft has built in accessibility checkers. So when you're in PowerPoint, all you do is go in and you click on check for accessibility and it will tell you all the things that are wrong or not accessible and it will help you fix those kinds of things. So. Um, it's really, really awesome. Um, I also use AI to do accessibility checking and that's like, I'm just on the real big AI bandwagon right now. I can't speak, but <laughs> yeah. So you're going to hear a little bit about that today. Um, so I'm going to move a little bit out of quick pace. I'm sorry about that, but um, let's play a little game right now. You all have your devices. Hopefully you're all on. There's 15 of you on. So um Okay, so what you're gonna do, and you should have this in front of you now, is you're going to try to match the famous person with a disability. And just let me know how you do with that. I'll give you like a minute or so. And if you don't know anyone, uh, share. Selena Gomez, Steve Jobs, Beethoven. Two people from Harry Potter. <laughs> I don't know why I use them, but I like Harry Potter. And Einstein, if you didn't know who that was, just saying. Let me see if I can see. Did you all get that, by the way? Like, are you playing it right now? Is it working? Okay, cool. <laughs> Is it hard? Yeah. Do you need a hint? Yeah. Um, Cher has two. Um, Einstein has two. And who's the other one that has two? Uh, Agatha Christie, I think it is. Yes. She does. I should have listed two for Selena. All right. I don't know um, if I see the answers right now. Yep, that's right. Are we good to move on? Yeah, okay. <laughs> I just That's the first time I've used the match thing. I hope it was fun, but you can see like if you use this pro program, you can do some fun things. Um, again, multiple means of representation. You know, I've been doing this for a long time and it's funny, multiple means, multiple me 18 times, uh, multiple means of representation. You know, for for instructors, for us as adults and our students, you know, it means different things for both. And I'm going to try to like hone in on how that can help both you as the instructor and us as the student and vice versa. Um, offer content in various formats. So use text, use audio, use video to accommodate different learning preferences. Make sure everything's clear and organized. Make sure you have text to speech. There's outlining that you use pictures and images, graphs, you know, charts and maps. And um, ways to do that 
you know, there's digital textbooks and supplemental materials. And one of them that I really, really love is called Bookshare. So if anyone in your um, class or anybody in your university has a print disability, and that could be so many different ways, it doesn't mean they're blind, it can be dyslexia, CP, any other reading barrier, this is completely free to them. And it's all of these books, including um, books like, uh, you know, like required course books and also just regular reading are in here. And you just have to ask your disability office to, you know, add the student to that. And it's it's free. It's completely free for them. Uh, and it's it's pretty amazing. They can control the pace and and they can control the text and they can even see the text as they're reading um, get highlighted. And the Diagram Center also has some math tools. So like that really helps with math. They have image descriptions. You can help like by putting uploading things that will help you with descriptions. There's apps that do that as well. Um, but accessible math is the reason why I use this. And 3D printing, they have a bunch of those. And again, free. Um, and I love Speechify. Speechify is fantastic. It works on all devices, but it also works on the computer. So it will turn anything to text. This example here is actually taking a text out of a textbook and taking a picture of it, and then it turns it to text. And I'm going to just show you this video because I love, I think this is so powerful and I use it. If you're like a commuter or you're, you're going anywhere, um, or you just are that person that needs to hear and see, this is such a great way. Okay. So to take photos of a textbook and add the textbook to Speechify, it's relatively easy. All you need to do is click the plus button, click the camera icon, and I'm going to add these two pages for my textbook. Um, now, I don't want to include this um, image in there. So actually, images are fine. Um, all I need to do is take a picture of the text on the page. On this page, I don't want to include this text, so I just put a white piece of paper over it so it gets covered. Take a picture of this page. Great. Click the check sign. And all right, from the field. From field to the front page, T. R. Mill Brock in the Age of Reality TV in 2010, a French documentary night in the book game, sparked outrage for reimagining famous psychology I occult experiment as a reality TV show. Young women participants side. Okay, so I'll pause there. So he has it very set to fast. You can slow that down. You can change the voice. You can change. It actually sometimes translates for you as well. So <clears throat> Jessica's been using it since October probably since that presentation. Um, I've been using it for like 10 years. I think it's awesome. Um, you can read emails that way. Any any text at all, um, if it's on the computer screen, it will read to you. Uh, again, totally free, hopefully useful for some of you. Uh, I hope you like that. Uh, then there's icons for everything. And I think this came up in a previous session. So if you've been on most of the sessions, this did come up, but I think adding icons to any like document, syllabus, presentation always helps with uh, people who are visual or cognitively impaired or any sort of disability. And um, it just makes things look prettier. So this is called the noun project and you can just go to the noun project and uh, search anything that you want and it will give you multiple images for that. And they're totally free to use, especially in education. And then there's this hidden thing called perchance. So does anybody, is anyone reading the fourth wing or the iron? Like, I'm like obsessed with this new dragon kind of fantasy book. Yes, somebody else's. I even got a signed, you can't see it, but um, I've got a signed one that I got on Black Friday from the author. So this is Tarn. And all I did was I described him in perchance and perchance is like it's hidden. So you can click this link and you'll get right to here and you go in and you can, you can do any search. I'm just going to do it with you. So um, I don't know. You you can just describe anything that you want. So I'm just going to put um, what was my first up? a horse running in field. And then I can either choose a cinematic picture, a 1970s photo. I can go in and like do fantasy painting, fantasy fantasy portrait. Let's do fantasy. Let's see what it comes up with. I literally haven't done this one yet. So totally free, by the way, everybody. So chat and they want you to charge you $20 a month to use it. Chat GBT. This is completely free. 
Oh, that's cool. <laughs> and feel free to unmute so I can hear your expressions of ah. Uh... <laughs> um, so what I would do is, so say I really love this one, I can just save that image and, you know, call it my horse. And then I can use that on my, you know, whatever, my document, my picture, my PowerPoint presentation, whatever I want. I can change the style. Um, I can go in and do like, I don't even know, an illustration. Give it a sec. And now it's an illustrated one. Isn't that wild? Is that like mind blowing? It's bad and good, right? Because the world's changing so fast and no one's doing this art anymore, but also good because we can do these really neat things with it. So that's per chance. Um, yeah, Leanne, I agree with you. Um, our artists are really being hurt. Um, but uh, in the other sense, if I just wanted to like, I don't know, get a dragon tattoo, this is kind of a cool way to do it. <laughs> Not that I'm going to do that, but I'll just throw that out there. Um, so course content, when you're looking at that, your students, um, their participation and expression, I just want to remind everybody, I do a whole thing on rubrics, um, just offer clear instructions and assessments, allow them to express their knowledge through diverse forms. So if you're saying write an essay, have some pe have students be able to do a presentation or a multimedia project. Ensure that your syllabus is completely accessible and easy to navigate. And the ways to do that is just, just make those clear um, expectations. Use the Blackboard Rubric Builder. Use ChatGBT to do rubrics. I'll show you in a minute how to do that. Um, iRubrics has a bunch of them. Canvas has them as well. So there's a lot of different ways to create a rubric. And if you don't know what a rubric is, it's just a way for a student to like know exactly what's expected out of them and um, be able to be successful in what they do. Um, also, other engagement strategies for students would be team building, doing activity stations, the games, gamification. I'm going to show you a little trick in a second. Um, collaborating with each other and then the multimedia uh, materials. So um, I just want to tell you this, too, and I'm not going to get into all of this, but if you're teaching online, I mean, if you're teaching face to face class, class offer an online option make make it hybrid what if someone's sick what if they just can't get in for the day what if they're depressed and they can't get out of bed at least they can join you online and the other really neat thing about having that is to be able to kind of um vary your instruction <clears throat> but ask them ahead of time if they need accommodations send the materials set up an asl interpreter if you need to and then what I love is um, Zoom does this new feature called the summary, and it will summarize everything that you've talked about in your lecture, and you can actually use that for notes. So even if you're not doing the online piece, you can run your Zoom and have it do summary for you. It's unbelievable. Has anyone used it on this call or, or no? Yeah, okay, so you have used it, Amy. Anyone else? Well, Amy, can you unmute and tell us how you've used the summary? I use it for meeting notes, actually. So I facilitate um, some calls. And uh, rather than taking notes anymore, I just turn this on and have it condense my notes for me. And then that's what I send out to people after who couldn't make the call. And it has, it has awesome. opened up my life quite a bit because I was <laughs> very bad at taking meetings. <laughs> like my least favorite thing. So it now it's just like take some time to clean up. Like, yeah, it does a really good job. Um, and yeah, and it takes a little bit of time to clean up, but not as bad as if you were to take them and try to go back and do them again. So, so do that. That's just a little tip. Um, and then gamification, play games. They're fun and they're like proven to help. Uh, they help increase productivity by transforming serious work into exciting, engaging play. I'm going to show you right now how to use quizzes as um a game-based thing. And I'm also going to show you how we save time doing it. So here's an example. I, I'm going to show you how to do this. If you go into quizzes, you can find different quizzes that are already here. You can import with YouTube, um, Google Slides, a custom prompt if you want, it has AI built in, or you can create with a link. So I'm going to just, I'm just taking the project echo page link. This is like a last minute thing I want to show you. Whoops, let me shut that off. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to create with a link.
Yes, I think the it, they do capture audience questions too for that. So I'm going to convert a URL to a quiz. And then I'm going to just say do five questions from that. OK, so it actually just created this quiz on Project Echo. Um, when was when were they established? I'm hoping 2003 is the right answer. If not, we can fix that. <laughs> um, when is what is the main goal to develop knowledge? So all the, all the green ones are the right answers. It gives you wrong answers. It gives you timer. You can shut that off if you want. That that makes people really stressed out. Um, what is the do they use for the development novel technology and do they provide care to patients no so hopefully that's accurate sometimes it's not but how fast and fun and easy is that and then you can create little links and put images and then it automatically is a quiz for you to use with your students or with anyone that you're presenting with and that's just one way to use quizzes there's a whole bunch of other like ways to use quizzes um, who's heard of it? Like anyone have you all heard of it or anything? Yeah. Okay, great. Awesome. In the interest of time, I'm going to speed, speed up a little, um, note taking strategy. So if you do guided notes, I've been talking about this for years, AI tools, um, Google PowerPoint, they are all fantastic doing note taking, uh, rewordify is also another way. So what rewordify does is if you go into, um, Rewordify, and if I want to go and copy, say, some of this text right here, I'm just going to take this little paragraph, and I go into Rewordify, which is kind of an ugly site, to be honest. It's like at this yellow and, and stuff, but I can hit, I can paste that in, and I can click it to Rewordify it for many different ways. I can, whoops, I can go in and look at the stats. I can look at the parts of speech. It can tell me all the different pronouns, adjectives. I can print learning activities, and this is the one you want to write down. It's called CLOZE, C-L-O-Z-E, and that will turn it into a guided note. And then I can just hit print, and then all of a sudden it eliminates all the words and creates a guided note for you immediately based on the text that you just pasted in. And again, chat GPT will do that, all your AI things, but I like Wordify because it will also tell you if things are that it gives you vocabulary, word bank, matching, but it will also like turn words into um, easier to understand words. Plain language is what we call it in the disability field. So that's just one other way. Um, this Padlet is really neat for you to use with your students to input information. This is just a person-centered plan that I created about myself, where I live, some of the favorite food I have when I'm reading. What I'm listening to, but it's a nice way for you to get like engaged with your audience. I could create a Padlet for you to respond. Uh, it doesn't have to be this. It could just be anything that you want to like collaborate on a board with. Um, and I also use Google Jamboard to do the same thing. So a quick down and dirty collaborative board tool. Um, Krista, what do we have till four or do we have till like 345? Till three. I mean, till three, I'm like, sorry, you're three, your time. Okay. Um, another thing you can use is Animoto with your students for them to create quick videos. And I think it's really fun. Um, here's a little video on how to use Animoto. You can watch this later. It's very easy. You upload a couple of images, some text, and boom, you have a, a video that your students can create. And I'll tell you what, if you tell someone to write a three page paper on a topic and you have them do a video, they're gonna do the same writing, except they're gonna create a video to it too. And so, you know, it's the same kind of outcome, the same assessment, but more robust and more engaging for the student. So I, I love using video, um, it's, it's really fantastic. I also love otter.ai for note-taking on top of Zoom, um, this will take anything you just hit record you can upload your recordings to otter ai it will summarize it it will identify all of the people all the different speakers and it will like create really cool summaries for you and if you haven't tried it it's free i think you get um 600 minutes or something for free a month so you can you can 
like suggest this to students to use in a lecture if the professor is okay with it. Um, it's just another way of, again, just multiple means of just honing on that language. And then um, I talked a little bit about chart charts and graphs. So when you're explaining a topic, sometimes it's really good to put that visual up for charts and graphs. Um, Canva, if you use Canva, they have a whole bunch built in. This just is a link to some of them uh, that I have. So here's one, like, it's just the word happy and it breaks it down. Um, mammals. So you can see the visual of it's pretty nice. There's a timeline for December. Um, oh, my, that's my, my, my pad just stopped working. Um, so the December timeline. Yes, Amy. I was going to ask about your, uh, how you feel about accessibility with Canva. Like I've used it, but I feel like whenever we create something and then go to turn it into a PDF and then make that PDF accessible, it's felt a bit like a nightmare. <laughs> yeah, so. sometimes it's a good question. Um, the presentations are really good now. They do build in accessibility into the presentations. Um, PDFs, yeah, you always have to double check and make sure that they have the um, accessibility built in. You could open it in Adobe, but doing it for like, um, you know, like for the presentation piece and making sure that there's text and not just images is really the key to making sure it's accessible. So that's a really good question. Um, also mind map is a great collaborative software to I, like, so if you have group projects and you want two or more students to write a paper or do a project or anything, um, they can create um, a mind map or a concept map and do the outline. And this is also really good just to have your student share with you before they um, do a, an assignment so you can see the thinking and that will eliminate some of the using the AI to cheat kind of stuff what people are worried about. So creating these mind maps are really neat and mind uh, Mindomo is free and I, I really like that. I've used it for a lot of, a lot of years. Um, I'm just gonna go into Canva for a minute. Uh, I love Canva Magic Studio. It's my new obsession and it maybe it will be yours too. Let me just try it. Did you see how it translated things for you? Isn't that crazy? Oh my gosh. So anyway, Magic Studio is an AI feature built in. You are all educators, so it's free for everybody. Um, I thought we could play with it. Let me show you real quick. Um, where's my Canva tab? I mean, I just shut it, but let me open it up again. Okay. So what I wanted everyone to try to do is what you, there's Magic Studio. When you log into Canva, do you all have an account on Canva? As most of you do. If not, you can create one. Um, and you can just watch. So you click on Magic Studio. And I thought if everyone, I'm just going to share this real quick. If everyone tried Magic Studio with me, uh, you can create a quick design of the title of your program or something interesting that you're doing. Choose like a favorite and then save it as a ping, a PNG. So let me show you how to do that. And then I thought maybe you could try it. So if I click Magic Studio and then I go in to Magic Design, so Magic Studio, Magic Design. This is the presentation one. I can click Try Magic Design. And then it's going to um, ask me to try now. And then what I do is I type in like five words. I'm just going to use one I already wrote. And it's going to create a design for me right now on UDL, Multiple Means of Representation, Inclusive Higher Ed Technology. So I can see that with those words, it kind of created this design for me. And if I liked one, 
which I'm more of a plain kind of, I can customize the template. And I might make this text a little bit larger. I can even click this thing called Magic Write if you haven't used it. And then you can rewrite it. You can summarize. You can do all sorts of other things. Oh, all right. Yeah, thank you for coming. Sorry, people have to go. Um, what you can do is hit Share. And then you, um, you download it as a ping. And then that's, that's the way to do that. So um, what I was thinking you could do is upload it. But we don't have like a ton of time to play with it. So play with it. Um, it it's just really cool. I. I'll tell you, I made like a bunch of little videos with it and it did a fantastic job. And you just go back to home and you click on Magic Studio and then you can click Magic Design for Video. And all you do is upload your pictures and some text and it will literally create a video for you. So it's just wild. This is a project I designed. So I can just boom, 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 Future Quest Island. And then Click generate. And now it created this quick video. So it made it in the wrong style for me, but I can go back and fix that. So I just really wanted to share it because I think, you know, if you're doing um, a class, if you're teaching a class, if you're running a project or a program or something, you know, add yourself to the syllabus, you know, we'll go into this in the syllabus one, but it's really kind of neat what you can do with it. So that's Canva. Um, you know, the AI revolution is here. If you ignore it, you're going to go down this slope and then it's going to be tough to get back up. So I would say try to embrace it a little bit. Try to understand what AI is. Um, generative AI is kind of what most of it, you know, what I'm using is. Um, there's different types. There's natural processing. It's basically taking Google and like having it interact as a human to you in a way, but even though it's AI and it will, if you ask it questions, it will answer questions. It will be a really good assistant to you. It's a machine learning, so sometimes it's wrong, and sometimes there's some things in it that you know you raise an eyebrow, but it really does help. It helps me sometimes organize my thoughts, and it might help you with that as well. Um, AI it helps with independence. You know, this here's an example of a, a, a an individual who can't really get dressed on their own, and this robot, this AI robot, is dressing them. I mean. How nice is that? So the parent or the family member doesn't have to do that. Or even with independence as a tutor. And, you know, I have this video, um, you know, tutors and everyone goes to tutoring when they're not understanding things. And, you know, if you are looking at one-to-one -one tutoring, you have more of a mastery of skills than if you're in a class or if you're in um, even in your master of learning. So one-to-one -one has a higher rate of of student learning and why not use AI to help with that? Why not use it if you're struggling with math? So here's some tools that you can use. Um, Chat GBT, Claude AI, Bing, Bard, and Deep AI. I'm gonna tell you two right now that you should look at is Claude and deepai.org. And I'm gonna show you what's so cool about Claude. So I'm gonna just add a quick, um, this is the presentation from today, and I can just say, um, can you review and recommend any um, how to create this in plain language? I probably spelled that wrong, but so I can upload a file to here and it will like review and, and do whatever. And of course, okay, hang on. It logged me out. <laughs> I'll try a different, I'll try something smaller because we're, we're really running out of time. So let me just grab a syllabus. Oh, it is doing it.
Give it a sec. So here's a brief plain language description of the document and it will magically do that for me. It includes explanations, course details. There are also appendices, the purposes guiding file. So kind of like we'll review for you, but it can take it to another level where it can put it into tables, you know, create that in a table, please. I like to be kind to the AI. I know it doesn't need me to be kind, but I just, you know, like to emanate the kindness. I'm glad I'm not the only one who does that. <laughs> I know it's like, I'm so weird, but like, look at this. It's, it's gonna, it's so wild what it does. I see other people shaking their head. Um, three minutes, we have three minutes, all right. All right, you get the idea. Um, uh, the other ones are some prompts that you can use it for students. So help me with um, managing my time better, uh, check my spelling and grammar, provide tips on note-taking. How can I simplify my complex course materials? You can ask, the chat or the AI this question, check my syllabus for plain language, offer guidance on using inclusive language in the course, um, provide feedback. These are just some tips that I'm giving you to use. Um, yeah, I say hi to, I say thank you to Alexa too. And keep digging deep with it. If you don't like the answer, ask another question. You can just keep doing that and keep just pretending you're asking a colleague that's like really, really, really smart. I mean, you probably have those, but like even additionally smart. Um, I would do an activity with you where you go to ch uh, chat open AI and you ask it to, or deepai.org, um, create a one play page flyer about my program, or um, I need a tip on making a UDL syllabus. So let's just quickly, quickly do that. Um, I'm a professor at Minot. Please help me create a... useful tip sheet on making a UDL syllabus. And there it is. Like, hello, that's freaking, that's really awesome. <laughs> um, incorporate these ways, flexible assessments, um, technology accessibility. And then I can take it, my syllabus, pop it in and then have it rewrite it for me. So just some of those tips and tricks as well. So that, um, is the crux of like making representation in a 45 minute ish session. And I hope that you learned some stuff today. I hope it wasn't too overwhelming for you. I know a few people did have to go. Um, yeah, does anyone have any questions for me or any thoughts? Or... It's a quiet group, it's a Monday. <laughs> and I was just talking on mute, so <laughs> um, I'm looking for questions on chat. I don't see any yet, but I thought it was fantastic. I got some new takeaways for sure. Looks yep. like people are excited to to play around with the new tools for sure. So if you want, um, for those of you that stayed, um, no, she's going to send this out anyway. Um, this this is the student link. So you can log in anytime to Nearpod and just get access to this if you want um, till the end of July. And I'm happy to share more stuff. Um, you never know. Maybe we'll do follow up sessions and things like that and get like do just like a half an hour activity or whatever, you know. But I appreciate you all taking the time and staying and. Yes. And also readjusting your schedule for 